Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. Good. I'm here with Representative Sandra Major, a Republican, who represented the 111th District of Pennsylvania, which included Sullivan, Susquehanna, Wayne, and Wyoming counties from 1995 to 2016. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. And the legislative district at one time included all of those counties, but now it's only part of Susquehanna and Wayne counties. As That's reapportionment right. shifted, um, the district shifted too. It always shifted east because of the population in Pike and Monroe County. And the burst of population in those counties impacted those northern northern tier counties and shifted our legis my legislative district east. Right. Your boundary changed quite a bit. Yes, it did. The time yes, you were it did. Here. From the time I was elected in 1994 and took office in 1995, mm -hmm. as you said, it was part, it was all of Sullivan, all of Wyoming, part of Susquehanna County. At one time, the district even included, when I first ran for office in 1988, the district even included three townships in a borough in Bradford County. Okay. So it was one of the largest legislative districts in the, in Pennsylvania oh and certainly in rural Pennsylvania. Wow. You had your hands full. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yes, a lot of miles, a lot of miles, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> a lot of cars, a lot of miles. So. Before you had to cover all those miles um, in office, tell me a little bit about your background before you got into public life. Um, tell me about where you grew up, your family, and mm -hmm. some of your early jobs. I grew up in Susquehanna County, very near Elk Mountain, which is a ski resort in northeastern Pennsylvania. So I grew up, uh, attended Mountain View High School, uh, graduated from Mountain View High School, and then went on to Keystone College and graduated from Keystone College. I have my associate's degree and did go on to the University of Scranton, but unfortunately didn't graduate from there to obtain my bachelor's degree. I got into working. I uh, had the opportunity to first go to work for the Erie Lackawanna Railroad when it was a boom in Lackawanna County okay. and started to work there at a very good wage for a young girl and uh, so got working there and then just kind of evolved from there and working. Um, went to work as Secretary of the President at Lackawanna Junior College, okay. uh, which was junior college at that time. It's now known as Lackawanna College and uh, so worked there and uh, basically got it, you know, Grew up in rural Susquehanna County, uh, did a lot of the activities that young people in the counties, in, in the rural areas do, uh, but was very, uh, loved to ski. As I said, I grew up near Elk Mountain and really enjoyed skiing and so worked at Elk Mountain for years, uh, for many years, uh, part time. So. Wonderful. And then you eventually became a legislative aide? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, after my work at Lackawanna College, uh, my family was always, my grandfather was a, was a member of the Pennsylvania yes. House of Representatives back in the 40s. So our family was always very political. I mean, was, is various, is families have various conversations around the kitchen table. Very often our kitchen table conversation revolved around politics and discussing mm -hmm. uh, what campaigns and who was running for office. And not only at the local level, but state and national level, my grandfather was very, very involved. and. Uh, so we heard a lot of conversation as young kids. I had two sisters and a brother, uh, an older sister and a younger sister and a younger brother, and uh, so a lot of our conversation. So I really took an interest in politics very early on in life. Uh, I remember back in the Nixon years, I was a Nixon girl at the Harford Fair, and uh, so and was a young Republican growing up, and so very involved in Republican politics in the local community. Um, I always found it very interesting, mm -hmm. really found it very interesting, very exciting. I enjoyed the, the uh, connections with various people and the interactions with people. I, I really enjoyed that part of it. And so back in, uh, as Carmel Siriani, who was a member of the House of Representatives at that time, she was a very dear friend of the family and she had the opportunity for the, the staff person in her office ran for a registered recorder in Susquehanna County and won that position and so the position in her office opened up. At that time, uh, district offices, uh, as even though the 111th district was as large as it was and that was the point of time that it included three townships in Brad, three townships in a borough in Bradford County, Sullivan County, Wyoming County and part of Susquehanna County and so we only had one district office in the Montrose area mm -hmm. where the representative was from that region and Montrose is the county seat of, of Susquehanna County. So um, uh, the, I was um, interviewed for the position, was very fortunate to have gotten it back, you know, to attain the position back in 1980 and served as a legislative aide for Carmel. And back in that day, we, we had a little a typewriter, an IBM selector typewriter <laughs> on the desk. 
Uh, we shared a fax machines were just starting to evolve at that point in time. We shared a fax machine with the local with the next door attorney's office. And so it was it was a whole different way of operating. Sure. We had a telephone on the desk and it had one line and that was it. So uh, it had a whole button, I think I recall, but uh, it was it was interesting operating back oh, in, sure. in the district office back in 1980. And certainly the constituents came in the office, and uh, I worked with them. And, and many of the same the same issues that you can my staff works with now. Um, people are concerned about their driver's license, about their vehicle registrations. We didn't have a lot of the senior programs then that we do now. Okay. You know, the rent and tax rebate program or the PACE program. Um, but certainly there was you know this, the the uh, the issues were very much the same back in that day. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned your grandfather was in mm -hmm. the house as well, mm -hmm. um, and your family uh, growing up in a Republican household. Would you say that your family um, was was um, uh, one of the reasons how you developed your own Republican attitudes? Absolutely, absolutely. My values, my principles um, for Republicans, my conservative philosophies um, were absolutely developed with my family. Um, my mother, interestingly enough, uh, we skipped a generation of, of po politicians and that was because my mother was uh, the secretary to the local common pleas judge in Susquehanna County. So they cannot be involved in politics right. in any way, shape or form. So she did. She, if she worked for 28 years as a, as she became a court reporter and, and worked just 28 years in Susquehanna County as the court reporter with our one one judge, common pleas judge. And she actually worked with two judges. But but as she enjoyed politics too, she could not be actively involved in politics. So sure. yes, I was, as my grandfather, I was very active in helping local candidates. I mean, I became very, uh, very active. And as I said, I was a young Republican, became very active in the Republican women's organization, still am very active mm -hmm. in that, and uh, in the county committee. So. Okay. so then what eventually led you to run for the House? Because I, I knew the job as a legislative aide, understood the job, and, pre, and very much felt I could do the job. As, as I indicated earlier, I'm a very much a people person. Um, and, and knew that uh, that was, I think, as I saw people coming in the district office and the issues that they could, that concern them, I thought I could be a voice on their behalf okay. and really represent what their concerns and, and, and help resolve their, their problems in Harrisburg. Um, I liked the challenges that faced them. I came to Harrisburg, I ran for office first in 1988. It was a seven-way primary. Um, and I lost to a young man, uh, Ken Lee, whose father was former Speaker of the House. So it was, uh, I lost by less than 200 votes. And it was, uh, it was interesting because my grandfather and, and Kenley Sr. were very dear friends. They were golf partners, very, very, the families were very close. So it was difficult for the two of them to have the two of us running to get against each other. But uh, both said, hey, one of the kiddos will win and, and they'll do fine. So that's, and then it was interesting. Um, as I lost that election back in 1988 by less than 200 votes, I, of course, stayed very active in, in Republican politics because for me that's what it was all about. It wasn't just about a title or you know a position that I was after. It was about doing a job and the, doing the right thing for the Republican Party. So I stayed very actively involved. Uh, I went to work for a company in the area that and sold advertising for them. Um, and which kept me very out there in the public eye, kept me out there in the business community, uh, was very helpful for me in, the, in it really expanding my um, interest and knowledge and people, getting to know people better in the community and more people in the community, that type of thing. And um, so in 1991, the county treasurer in Susquehanna County was retiring. And I thought, you know, that's the job I would be interested in doing. And so ran for that job and, and did, did win, won the primary and then won the general election. So was serving as Susquehanna County treasurer in my first term and got a phone call one day from Ken Lee, young Ken Lee, uh, who had won back in 1988, and he was in his third term here in Harrisburg and had decided that maybe it just wasn't the right thing for him, that he wasn't going to run for a fourth term. So he, he approached me and he said, Sandy, you know, are you still interested? Is it something you'd still like to do? And I said, absolutely, absolutely would still be interested in doing it. So I immediately started to put a campaign together. Uh, and this was in 1994. Uh, started to put a campaign together and ran. And once again, it was a three-way primary. Um, and the district at that time was all of Sullivan County, all of Wyoming County, and part of Susquehanna County. And so put a campaign together and was, was ultimately successful in winning that uh, primary, then winning the general election. So that's how I got here in 1995. Wonderful. Yeah. What was your experience with campaigning, especially your first campaign? I always enjoyed campaigning. 
Because once again, I'm a people person. I enjoyed getting out and meeting the public. Um, speech, speaking was never my thing. I, I've not, uh, I'm not always comfortable, and still after 22 years, not always comfortable about speaking. But um, certainly, you know, evolved. And, and as I, I'm more of a one-on-one -on -one type person. I want to meet the person individual. Mm -hmm. Want to have conversations. Knocked on a lot of doors in a rural area. That's very difficult to do. And certainly, um, while we put a lot of emphasis on knocking on doors okay. at, at this time and generation of campaigning, I'm, I was doing it back in. 1994 and it was very successful and people appreciated somebody coming in in, the, in their barn and, and, and you know standing next to them as they're milking the cows and having a conversation about what they wanted to do in Harrisburg and so that's and that was successful for me I mean I just really really worked worked very hard uh, put a campaign together and I'm kind of I'm more of a hands-on type person that uh, I really like to control um, what's really going on I, I, I find it difficult very often to pass you know to delegate and uh, to others to do the work that I feel I should be doing. And so um, put a campaign <clears throat> together and it was ultimately successful. So had a lot of great support and a lot of good help. Did you notice if campaigning changed a lot, especially for you, in subsequent Absolutely, elections. it's changed. It's changed so much. As I said, knocking on doors is, is absolutely important. Uh, we use telephone now a lot, too. We do outreach from telephone. And you can, in a rural area, you can cover a lot more area. Um, but I found, as I was elected to the House, and as I um, was invited to do various activities in my legislative district, I stayed very, very high profile. I felt that if I was really doing out there doing my job as a legislator, whether I was uh, involved in parades or whether I was involved in chamber events or breakfast meetings, I mean, whatever whatever activity, you know, you've got the Farm Bureau is very active in my area, uh, Bluestone Organization is very active. You've got numerous organizations, township officials and uh, county officials that you, if you're, if you're out there working with those people and really engaging them in what's important important to them and working on their behalf in Harrisburg and getting to know and have, developing those good working relationships, I think campaigning becomes secondary. It's about your job first and then campaigning. But there again, you've always got to remember, when you're a member of the House, you're running every two years. So you've always got to have that campaigning at the forefront, um, but you also, it becomes part of your, your, your work. And, and while we can't combine the two of them, you know, really, um, I think that one actually, they do intertwine in many ways. Do you think that your time as county treasurer helped you in, um, with some of the, uh, the experience in a public office? It did. I certainly, oh, actually, absolutely with budgeting and understanding a budget because I was involved in the county budget. And, and, and while I wasn't directly involved in any way, the county commissioners certainly handled that in, in, in the counties. But as a county treasurer, um, I'm one of the signature, I was one of the signatures on the checks as, as payments were being made out of the county. Um, and certainly handled all the deposits in the county, so had a, had a, had a concept of, of the magnitude of the dollars that come into a county and, those, and the, the different human service um, programs that a county has to be involved with and all that a county you know, really does um, overall to provide services in the local communities. So. What were your first impressions of the Capitol? especially around swearing in time for your first time. The Capitol is a magnificent building. It is just absolutely beautiful. I, I know when I go out a lot of, very often, in fact, I just did it last week, go out to talk to school students and do programs within schools. That is something I always stress to them and, and ask them, how many of you have visited your state capitol? And the few will raise their hands and always say to me, you know, if you want mom and dad to do like an overnight, just a one day trip, I mean, this building is absolutely magnificent. The history, the beauty. I remember um, capital, capital Preservation actually doing the cleaning of the marble um, back in the early years when I was here. And I was just really, really struck by, um, you know, how that marble had, had discolored over the years and the cleaning of it. And just when you walk in that rotunda, that main rotunda, and just, just look around, I mean, just the magnificent between the paintings and the marble and the tile floors, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful building. And it just, and then you walk in the hall of the house, and just, I mentioned that in my speech yesterday. I mean, it's just a privilege to be in that chamber and to, uh, to you know, just, it's something you should never take for granted as a member of the House of Representatives. I mean, it's just a magnificent, magnificent building. So everywhere you go, I mean, whether you go into the courts, the courts are just the Supreme Court, you know, their chambers, I mean, just a gorgeous building, gorgeous. So I can't stress that enough. Oh, absolutely. I want to go back to your district for a moment. Okay. Um, in the beginning, you touched on, on how the boundaries had changed mm -hmm. over the time that you were, that you were in office. Um, 
In addition to the boundaries, describe for me your district, both geographically as well as the constituents. Geographically, um, it's very large. It's inter like right now, um, as my, I have a district office in Montrose and I have a district office in Honesdale, both county seats of, of the two counties. Um, and it takes me an hour and 10 minutes to get from one district office to the other. So there's a, the, the district, the 111th district is very rural, is predominantly farms. Okay. Of course, we've had a, a huge infusion of the Marcellus shale industry. I mean, that's really taken off in the last uh, seven to eight years. Mm -hmm. um, so you're seeing a lot of, we see a lot of that activity. Um, but very rural and uh, most people, it, it's more like a bedroom community, especially Susquehanna County. A lot of people that live in the northern part of Susquehanna County work in Broome County, New York, uh, which is that Binghamton area. Um, a lot of the people who might live in the Clifford or the southern part of Susquehanna County work in the Scranton region. Wayne County is a little bit different. It, it has uh, a little bit more industry, a little bit more businesses, but I think people do um, tend to um, drive to the Lackawanna County, Luzerne County area um, in Wayne County for, for jobs. So um, Bluestone, uh, I mentioned that earlier, Bluestone is a huge industry and uh, that's a stone. People, I, it's interesting when I talk to people here in the Harrisburg area bring up Bluestone or have done legislation on mm -hmm. behalf of Bluestone and people are like, what, you know, what is that? Um, we certainly know about coal in Pennsylvania, we know about limestone, that type of thing, but Bluestone is a, a stone that is mined. Um, it's a stone that is cut and you see it on sidewalks, you see it all over the Commonwealth. And I've, I've been with colleagues different times and say to them, that's blue stone. It, it's a gray stone. It, they, we call it blue, but it's actually a gray stone that uh, sidewalks and walls and, and just uh, beautiful, beautiful. So uh, it's a beautiful region. It truly is. This time of year in the fall, it's just oh, yes. absolutely magnificent. So, but uh, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great uh, the summers are beautiful there too. I mean, it's just a great district to enjoy all the four seasons of Pennsylvania. Would you say that there are some issues that are unique to the constituents of your district? Yes, right now there are because of the, the Marcellus mm -hmm. drilling and that. There's, there's a lot of concern. Um, you know, there was, initially there was concern uh, about as the industry has evolved and the drilling has really moved forward like it has, I think some of the concerns that were the initial concerns, those, kind of, those have kind of gone by the wayside. But uh, there's, always, there's always those concerns about water water quality, there's concerns about air quality, um, because we're a rural area. I mean, many of the people that in my legislative district grew up in the area, but many people have come out of the New Jersey region, the Philadelphia region, New York City region, and bought, bought uh, summer homes or uh, second homes, that type of thing. And so you get a different personality, a different, okay. different personality of concerns. Um, in that district and, and so and there again sometimes those are the people I hear more from because they tend to be a little skittish about some of the, the drilling because they don't really understand it. Um, the, and, and they hear a lot of the media, the media reports, the misinformation on the fracking and uh, so they, they do have some concerns okay. but uh, that's what we're dealing with right now. Certainly that's, you know, that certainly has changed over my 22 years. Um, it was, initially it was, it was issues, whether it was, it was concerns for a senior citizen um, or whether it was concerns, uh, you know, for, for uh, education, that type of thing. I mean, certainly those, I think those concerns are pretty standard across the Commonwealth mm -hmm. and pretty standard most, uh, amongst most legislative districts. But uh, the Marcellus industry is really one that we've seen the change in my legislative district. Has it been difficult to balance um, being in Harrisburg and having your constituents so far away? Well, I've, my trip is about a two and a half hour trip from okay. the district to Harrisburg. And so I've always set aside my Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays to, when we're in session to be here in Harrisburg. Uh, now I serve as le a leader, so I don't serve in the committee process anymore. So I don't have that traveling around the state with committee hearings. I do serve on the policy um, committee, which I, I attend some of those hearings, but for the most part I've been focused, I do stay focused in the district. And I have always, always been in the district on a Thursday and a Friday to try to have office, uh, be in the office, be in the district offices to work with the constituents or meet with the constituents, and then be weekend, be around weekends to do, as I said, the parades or the mm -hmm. whatever dinners. Uh, I always say, tis the season of spring and fall dinners because we seem to have them in the spring, we seem to have them in the fall, and then in the summer they kind of slack, they do slack off. But they're, those are very busy times of the year, I, I believe, for any legislator. At least they have been sure. for me. Yeah. 
Would you say that during your time you would be more focused on district or legislation? I would be more cons more focused on district. Okay. I was very, very involved with constituent services. Um, it was always very important to me when that individual came in with whatever crisis was in their life, um, that whether they had something to do with creating it or whether state government created mm -hmm. the problem. Um, I was always very interested in helping to resolve because some of the folks that come in were just beside themselves. They didn't know how to find, how to figure out, or how to really get through the, the, the maze of, of red tape um, to provide the, to get the services they need. And, and uh, it's just amazed me in this whole um, adventure, I'll call it, of retiring, the number of people that have come in or called my district office. and. A couple of them have said to me, said to my staff, Sandy doesn't even know me, but I just want to tell her thanks because she helped me do this or she helped me do that. And there again, it's the district office staff who are really there on the front line. I mean, I would be, you know, traveling throughout the district doing whatever I needed to be doing. And that, as I said, very often it's dinners or it's lunches or it's, it's doing a tour of a farm or a bluestone quarry or, um, you know, handling a DEP problem or, or just what it was. And with the, with the natural gas industry, it's been touring um, well sites and pad, well pad sites and, and compressor stations and that type of thing. So as I'm out in the district doing what I need to be doing to become more knowledgeable to be able to then come back to Harrisburg and address the issues that I'm faced with addressing and voting for, um, the district office staff is, is in the district and I've always, I've always been very blessed with having excellent district office staff who are very caring, concerned people that when that constituent came in or called the office, um, they absolutely went to, did whatever they needed yeah. to do to try to resolve the, the inquiry or the problem that that pe person faced. And so uh, that's for me been very rewarding to make, to see the, to see the, the satisfaction, the smile on that person's face and, and just know that we've helped, cons helped them resolve whatever red tape they've had to get through in, in Harrisburg. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When you first got to Harrisburg and entered the House of Representatives, um, did anyone become a mentor? for you? Several people. Um, it's interesting in Harrisburg is when I first came to Harrisburg we were only in leadership by one person, in the majority by one person. Mm -hmm. um, that was the, the, the infamous um, uh, coup that uh, one member switched from a Democrat to Republican and uh, it was interesting we became the majority. And so <laughs> as I, as I uh, began to get to know people and understand it, I was just, you know, growing up in a rural area um, I, I tell the story that we don't have traffic lights. We didn't mm -hmm. have traffic lights in Susquehanna County. I mean, we could cross the street on, on Public Avenue in Montrose and not have to really worry about looking left or right. I mean, there was no traffic, okay, so we don't have to worry about it. Coming to Harrisburg, I'll never forget when I f stepped out of the Capitol one time, was walking to whatever event I was going to, maybe in the Hilton or wherever it was, and I mean, became, became very, very aware at that moment that you need to pay attention to your surroundings, walking, crossing a street, who's around you. I mean, you just absolutely needed sure. to pay attention to what you were doing. Um, and so mentors, absolutely. There, were, there was any number of my colleagues. And, and what I want to say was I realized and recognized very early the diversity of our caucus, of our Republican caucus. As I sat in the caucus room and heard, you know, as bills were presented <coughs> and heard the, the various comments and concerns, you realize that, whoa, these people don't represent the same constituency that I represent. Yeah. And so as you start reaching out to those those members, those other members, to have conversations with to, with them about what their district was like or what they they face, I'll never forget one member in the southeast when I said to him one time, "Oh, I've got a parade on Saturday." They said, "A parade? What do you mean a parade?" I said, "Well, I, parades are important in my district." And he said, "Well, I've never done a parade in my life." I said, "Well, you know, you should maybe start." And and it was interesting because he came back to me as he said, "I'm doing parades." He said, "You, I agree, they're great." He said, "They're great outreach." I said, "They absolutely are." Sure. I mean, so as you as you have those conversations with your colleagues and you get to under you become you know you come to understand mm -hmm. the different diversities of the commonwealth and the differences in the legislative districts and, and yes people you begin to work you develop friendships That's relationships right. with discussing issues and discussing issues um, how they might impact your district and how you need to stress that impact and and understand how they impact someone else's district um, and, and that's some of the problems sometimes when we can't get legislation passed sure. because of the state is so, and the different legislation will impact a, a, an area differently, so. Yeah. Anyone in particular that you'd like to mention that you maybe probably, you latched onto those first yes, few months? Yes, probably the first person who was, who was uh, most impressed to me was, was former Speaker of the House, Matt Ryan. Okay. And 
Matt was, it was interesting because I got to know Matt when he, when I worked for Carmel Siriani. Of course, Carmel worked with Matt. Matt was a rank and file member and then Matt got into leadership and mm -hmm. worked with Carmel. So very often he would call the district office and look, be looking for Carmel and so I might have a conversation. And upon her death, um, she had died um, after the 1988 election and he came up for the funeral and I had, I had gone to the airport to pick him up and, and there were some other members there. And, and we had a great conversation and, and he had said, so when I ran in 94, he was a little bit more familiar with who I was okay. and, and was very, you know, was very supportive and uh, uh, mentored me in, in my campaign, plus mentored me when I got here to Harrisburg. And, and Matt was just a, just a wonderful person. I mean, understood the, the process, understood, um, you know, the Harrisburg, the, the political, the politics of Harrisburg. And so um, really looked to him as a father figure yeah. here in Harrisburg and, and just uh, never never hesitated to go to seek advice from him. Um, certainly some of my co female colleagues uh, re represent Pat Vance mm -hmm. um, who is retiring also this year from the Pennsylvania Senate. Um, she was a great mentor too as a female. Uh, sat in front of me on the house floor and she was just always somebody on women's issues that I and, and health issues that type of thing that I could absolutely have a conversation with and just a conversation in general. I remember I broke a tooth one time when I was in Harrisburg and it was Pat. I went to and said Pat can you call a dentist and she absolutely she went right away did you know so God found a dentist for me but yeah you found <laughs> you, you felt right you develop friendships like that in Harrisburg but they're the two that quickly come to mind. Certainly many others because I've had the opportunity to work with so many people uh, serving on the leadership team for the last 10 years um, just developed some wonderful friendships and I think leaving the leaving my position uh, as a state representative that's one thing I'll truly miss is the colleagues and the, the camaraderie the friendships that we have and that we develop and, and it's so much about just interacting um, on the issues yeah. did you become a mentor for anyone over time people have told me I am yes yes some of the some of my uh, 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 more freshman members mm -hmm. I um, certainly haven't been here for 22 years, as I said, I'm a people person, and yeah. I, I know that it can be a little overwhelming uh, coming into this General Assembly, and especially now, we're 119 strong in our Republican majority, and uh, so it can be a little, little, uh, little I'm sure, overwhelming for some of those folks, because, you know, you, when you're involved in the campaign, the campaign is one thing, but then really coming to Harrisburg and doing the job, and that's one, that's one area I really thought that I had the advantage with having been a, a legislative aide. I understood the workings of the district office mm -hmm. and what those constituent inquiries might be and what those issues might be. So I came to Harrisburg, I think, with a little bit, um, lo a little bit better knowledge on you know what that was about, and then <clears throat> got to work through. But um, it can be overwhelming. Someone who isn't, doesn't have any political background or really hasn't been involved in the political process like I was growing up in it and with my grandfather and then District 8 and that type of thing. I, I've seen some of the freshman members um, come in and just kind of, I see the eyes and we call it like look, like the deer in the headlight look. <laughs> um, and uh, so yes, I, there's any number. And, and I reach out to any of the freshmen when they come in and say to them, um, I am there to, to help you in any way I can. I, I'm not going to just burden you and constantly be, you know, knocking on your door. Sure. Are you okay? Are you okay? You're, you're big boy and girl. And, and, but I would say to you that my door is always open. And certainly some, many have taken advantage of that and just come over to Good. chat and, and, uh, so, and some in particular. So. Very nice. Yeah. How was your relationship with the media, both in Harrisburg and in your district? Interestingly enough, the media in my legislative district, because Susquehanna County and Wayne County, and as you talk, I talked about uh, Sullivan and Wyoming County, mm -hmm. very rural areas, and because the northern part of the district is so in, in, the, in tune to the Broome County region and Binghamton News, and then you've got the, the lower part in Scranton or Luzerne County, uh, Wilkes-Barre News. And so w newspapers in my legislative district were uh, weeklies. I didn't really oh, have yeah. a daily. Okay. Somebody might get the Binghamton Press or somebody might get the Scranton paper. Um, they didn't pick up my articles or really pick up a lot of, oh. well, where Scranton did, but Binghamton didn't. Um, but my working relationship with the media, I mean, my local media, which is really small rural media, um, my Wayne County Independent, I mean, the reporter calls, and I certainly am always willing to talk to them. And so I think I had a good working relationship, but um, I didn't do a lot of uh, uh, didn't have to do a lot of press events, that type of thing, mm -hmm. because they were more concerned. Um, I, did just, I just didn't have the interaction with them okay. that other members might have. There are a number of informal caucuses within the House. Um, mm -hmm. How important are they for the members to belong? 
depending on what the members' interests are or what the interests are within their legislative district, I think they're very important because very often they're the time they're more of a grassroots type okay. uh, ability to have a conversation. Um, some of them are fun type things, like I think the Motorsports Caucus, that's kind of a fun type thing. Um, but some of the, the caucuses that I belong to, um, indeed they are, they are important to, to interact with those, those colleagues who might have those same interests, just to share um, and, and discuss those, those, um, those, whatever those issues might be. Do they play a role in the legislative process? I, maybe some of the conversations and the thoughts and the ideas that come out of them, but not, for the most part I don't believe okay. they do. That hasn't been my experience that they do anyway. Um, for the last um, number of years, you um, have been in leadership mm -hmm. um, as the caucus chair. Um, how has that been? Um, what was your experience like? It was a it was an exciting experience, an interesting experience. I've I tell people when they when I there again talk to freshmen or talk to new members of the house, um, and to explain the role that I do, I call myself the information tool. Um, as caucus chairman. Um, Certainly the, the whole idea of coming into caucus to talk about the bills, to have staff present mm -hmm. the information, the information first about what the bill is, the information about what any amendments might be, the pros, the cons, uh, who supports, who opposes, that type of thing. That's very, very important for the members to have that mm -hmm. information. Uh, I find that the members are very informed anyway. I put out a, 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 a report which we call the week ahead every week to, to keep, every week that we're in session to, to inform the members as to what legislation we might be considering. I also send out emails with, uh, that report any of the committee activities, uh, bills that are reported from committee. Uh, certainly when bills are posted uh, for consideration mm -hmm. um, to be voted on, put that information out. So I, I really, um, I put out an amendment report. Um, I try to get all that information out to the members to keep them informed so that their jobs will be easier and there's no, there's no uh, surprises because as, okay. as we go to the chamber and we go to vote, um, I think the members need to have all the information. I believe in the openness and the transparency of, of knowing what's in the bills and what the bills are going to do and the impact so that they can make the best vote for their, for their constituency. Okay. But it, it can be interesting because as you're dealing, uh, right now we're dealing with 119 members, you've got 119 people in a room who are all elected to office. So they're in that room and they're representing their constituency. And they come from varying backgrounds and so very often they want to share their, their knowledge, their expertise. Uh, some, some of the times it gets to the point where we think we're being lectured by, by various people. And I, you know, it's, it's, fun to, it's, it's good to share your, but you know, none of us, we're all intelligent people, so I don't think we need to be lectured. So it's sometimes, and there's sometimes there's, there's uh, different scenarios where one member might be upset with another member for an sure. amendment or what mm -hmm. happens. So we might have some, some controversial conversations, but I try to, to uh, while I, I try to, I believe everybody needs to have their say, um, and it's important for us to hear what they have to say. Um, uh, sometimes we have to you have to gavel people down and, sure. and call halt to, to what might be um, transpiring. So anyway, but caucus is caucus is interesting, and it does tend to go on quite lengthy because yeah. there's there's a lot of issues that uh, need to be discussed. So sure. and they're important issues that we're mm -hmm. dealing with. They're absolutely important issues. So much. What, one thing that it was I said that I talked to school students. One thing I stressed to them that there's thousands of pieces of legislation introduced every legislative session but ultimately less than 100 of those sometimes be actually become law. Right. So as we work on a lot of things through the, pro through the committee process, through the legislative process, it, it's, uh, it's amazing just how few pieces of legislation actually become law. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, mm -hmm. yeah. Getting into a little bit of legislative work now. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned about the Marcellus Shale, mm -hmm. uh, especially in your district, mm -hmm. um, has probably caused a lot of issues mm -hmm. in the district. Um, Tell me about some of the movements and legislation that you introduced to help put some people mm -hmm. at ease. Um, one piece of legislation that I worked on uh, last legislative session and this legislative session, I'm very disappointed I wasn't able to get it done. The bill's over in the Senate. Um, it's a bill that helped register recorders. As the industry were signing leases, leases of course are a legal document that, need to be, that needs to be filed in the courthouse. 
And so as these landmen were signing these leases, they might bring a pile of leases, say a couple hundred leases, into the registry and recorder's office and just drop them off, so to say, and then it was up to the recorder to actually record those deeds and leases. Mm -hmm. And so it became cumbersome as to the amount of leases that were and maybe the number of names that were on a lease and that type of thing. So recorders came to me and raised concerns about it, so I did introduce legislation. We did get through, get it, got it through the House. Um, but uh, the Senate uh, Environmental Resources Committee seemed to think that in the Senate, the staff there seemed to think that there were some problems with the bills and they never would move forward to work with the, um, with the Register and Recorders Organization to get those concerns resolved. So ultimately the building had passed. Another bill that it's extremely important in the legislative di district is House Bill 1391. And that's a bill that uh, I, along with my colleagues, Representative Everett, Representative Pickett, Representative mm -hmm. Baker, have worked with, uh, with the post-production issue. And yes. that has to do, once again, with leases um, and the cost of doing business for the industry um, and how those costs were passed down. Those, those costs are called post-production costs and how those production costs have been passed down to the landowners. And some landowners, um, as the as the industry was evolving and, and gas was, uh, things were going great, and, and right now the, the bottom's kind of fallen out of the gas pricing. Um, so the the uh, one company in particular and several other companies are starting to do the same thing, and is charging the co the post production. So that's a bill that we've really been working hard on, but we've just not been able. Mm -hmm. uh, we finished caucusing it yesterday, but with only two days left in the legislative session, we just now we know we're not going to be able to get that done. So I'm disappointed that I am not going to be able. You know, retiring, I'm not going to be able to come back and, and really get that bill rolling again next session. But I do believe my uh, successor will be very much involved in it, and I believe that Representative Everett and Representative Pickett and Baker will continue to do their work to try to resolve that whole post-production issue. Good. So, so know, it won't so. die. It won't die. Well, Good. it'll die at this legislative session, sure. but it'll it'll will bring it. They'll ho hopefully, they'll reintroduce it next session. So, um, would you say that the the majority of your district was in favor of bringing the Marcella Shale industry um, to your district? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, there were absolutely some concerns just because of the unknowns in the beginning. Um, what we had initially is a couple of companies. I mean, what happened with this is it's a very deep drilling mm -hmm. and so there was never a process by which to drill these wells. We had shallow drilling and we've had shallow drilling um, in Pennsylvania for many many years but this goes to a much much further depth right. this drilling and, and, and fracking and, and getting into this Marcellus shale. Mm -hmm. It's a much deeper shale so in other words there were concerns and these landmen would come and knock on a door wherever um, in whatever community they might be in and just talk about leases and as some of the farmers in Susquehanna County uh, remember back the generations and, and knew that the gas, they, they remember their, their ancestors, their fathers, their grandfathers signing leases back 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and, but knew that there was no process by which to drill the, the gas at, this, at that time. And then the, the industry developed a way by which to drill the gas by fracking, by the drilling and then ultimately fracking. And um, so as the industry started coming around to, to uh, lease land. Um, there was a lot of misin there was a lot of no a lot of misinformation. A lot of you know, who are these people? Well, my grandfather signed a lease 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Nothing ever happened, so nothing's going to happen now. And what the industry wasn't telling people is we have the technology now whereby to drill. So uh, um, as that started moving forward, um, there were some issues with some water. And uh, so that became a very controversial situation in one of the communities in Susquehanna County. And uh, while the industry claimed that they ultimately weren't responsible, DEP and, and took action and, and shut them down for a period of time. And um, so, yes, there was some, there's, there's always controversy. When you're dealing with something of that magnitude, there's, there's definitely controversy, there's different concerns. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it has um, worked its way out. And I, for one, as, as I started working with the industry and recognized the, um, just the amount of jobs, the, you know, recognized that the positive aspect that it could have for the community, I tried to work with the companies to stress to them that they needed to hold public meetings, they need to get involved in the communities, um, be a part of the communities, let people know who they were, let them know that they were that they had concerns and that they weren't there to just rape the land. They were there to, to really work in the community and do the right thing. 
and, and many of the companies have been great neighbors. They've, they've uh, one company in particular in our, in our region, Susquehanna County, was very instrumental in helping to build a new hospital. Um, you know, they've just done a lot of community outreach. They've done various golf tournaments, raising, raising money from, for the United Way, for the cancer organization. I mean, they do, uh, they really have done a lot. So it's been, while there, there were certainly concerns, it's been a lot of good neighbor uh, type of programs and outreach that the, that the companies have, have done and have pursued, and it's, it's been a good thing. Good, good. Can you explain your work on the legislation regarding the, the non-coal surface mining? Um, the efforts and the payment of the rollback taxes from the 2011-12. Um, it became Act 34 as it related to clean and green. Oh, that, that was legislation. Um, that was legislation that, at, that came out of a bill that, uh, once again, blindsided us. Okay. Um, that, was, that was the ultimate result of a sigh and die, <laughs> where legislation, I'm trying to think now just how that all worked, but... Um, it was it was legislation that we were in sigh and die, and it had uh, uh, it was a ten acre issue. I can't think of all the specifics, but um, yeah, it dealt with it to ensure landowners who began small non coal mining efforts did not have to pay the rollback taxes um, all of their land that was enrolled in the clean and green program. Right. Okay. Clean and green. Clean. You can have you have to have a, a minimum of ten acres to enroll in clean okay. and green. And so um, you can take out two acres at any point. It, if you're, you can sell out two acres, and I just can't think how that, what that, I can't think of right now how it was, because it goes back so long ago. That was about, so. No, talk, no, yeah. I'm, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you were also on a number of boards throughout, um, throughout your time, especially with um, FIA. Pennsylvania Hydrogen. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about your experience being on the FIA board. Wonderful experience at FIA. FIA is a, is a well, FIA was created by the, the state, um, by the legislature. Yes. And um, it's certainly to provide higher education, to help fund higher education for students. And Pennsylvania has numerous, numerous colleges and universities across our commonwealth. And it's, it's uh, certainly a resource. And it's, it's just evolved into an organization um, that's funded by the gets a lot of its funding by the legislature through the legislature, mm -hmm. and uh, but it's been it's been a really interesting uh, kind of a roller coaster. FIA had some issues back in the day, um, some things going on at FIA that that when I was first on the board, some issues about the members traveling and about maybe some spending that uh, that um, you know people didn't see it as really went directly towards co towards kids and college and mm -hmm. education, and so. Um, being on the board, we evaluated uh, a lot of, of some of the practices, some of the business practices at FIA, and reevaluated those practices and um, um, decided to do things a little bit differently. And so um, the board now is it's made up of, of members um, of the House and of the Senate. It's a very bipartisan board. Um, when we walk in the door, we leave our, our political hats at the door and uh, sit and talk for the betterment of kids and, and uh, how we can get the most dollars to, to young people who want Good. to go to university, colleges and universities in Pennsylvania and to, to help them fund because um, college education is extremely expensive and the debts that kids are you know, incurring right now, it's just huge expense and huge debt that when they graduate that they have to pay back. And so I, it's always been my mission to make sure that we get as many dollars out to those kids in the form of grants and low interest loans as we possibly can. So um, the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency is just a great program and, and I'm, hope, I'm very proud to be a part of it and certainly uh, wish it well because I'll be going off the board with my retirement. Oh yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, since you have been in office, technology has changed quite a bit. Um, especially being used by the house or on the house floor, computers, mm -hmm. uh, 24 hour news feeds, um, PCN, our local cable mm -hmm. channel. Um, what impact do you think a lot of this modern technology um, has on the legislative process? I think it's been a good impact. I jokingly tell people that when I first came to Harrisburg, my biggest concern when I got to Harrisburg on Monday morning was my mail folder. Mm -hmm. And my mail folder was just full of paper. And I mean, it, it was an expansive file that could be six inches thick. I mean, it was huge. And you always saw members walking around carrying their mail folders. We all did it. 
Um, today you see us walking around with our little telephones yes. and we're all connected and uh, certainly the, the uh, I think the uh, computers on the at the desk in the chamber are an ex wonderful thing mm -hmm. because I was here in the day when every bill was on our desk a paper copy every amendment was on our desk yeah. a paper copy and we had piles and piles and piles of paper and you'd, you'd you know you'd have a pile you'd put it on the floor and of course you know during the the critical times, <clears throat> excuse me, during budget, um, the critical times when we were working on bills when there might be a lot of amendments, um, there was a lot of paper on your desk. Mm. And so I think that as we evolved into that, um, mm -hmm. um, the computer error, um, it's been a very good thing. Uh, we can very quickly um, uh, bring up a bill on our computer. We can keep mm -hmm. it rolling. In other words, whatever legislation we're dealing with it is right there on our computer in front of us. Um, for the most part, most of us review the legislation before we get thought, but it's just good to know, um, just like yesterday, as we were moving a lot of legislation very quickly, um, and it had been legislation we've been working on, um, um, it was like, what's this bill? And then just, you know, you could sit at your desk and just quickly get a quick, um, um, all the information that I send out as caucus chairman, that's on the computer too for the members. I do that all by computer now. So if there's an amendment, you can see a quick, what we call a quick blurb on it, mm -hmm. uh, just a brief explanation. Um, so I think it's the technology, uh, the new tech world that we're into oh. has been a very, very good thing, I believe. Um, just because we've, we've saved a lot of trees, um, yes. a, lot, uh, a lot of trees have been saved here in Harrisburg since we've gone to technology. So, because um, we were, the paper was just unbelievable. And sure. of course, yeah, you might review it and you'd have, you might have a copy of the legislation down on your desk in your office. You'd have another one up on the, in the, on the floor. Yeah. I mean, it was just a lot of paper um, being wasted. Sure. So I think it's been a great thing. Has um, social media impacted the way you connect with your constituents? Yes, it has. And I, I have to say, maybe it's an age thing that I'm not, don't interact with it as, as much as I should, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty Facebook savvy, okay. um, email savvy. I do uh, read all my emails. I mean, my constituents do a lot. I, I receive a lot. And as I said before, the mail folder, I mean, I used to get letters from people and, and uh, any of the lobbyists, any of the uh, the state, the agencies, you know, would send everything by letter, um, by paper, and now we get everything by email, which is a good thing because um, you know on your server where it is, and you can go find it and and uh, read it if you don't have time to read it the moment that you get it. And and I do, as I said, get all my emails and do open all my emails to read them. We get a lot of uh, form emails, so to say, as we used to get form sure. letters. Um, so my staff, I'll say to the mothers, you know, please take off my system and try to address them. And, 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 but I do try to respond to everything that I receive. I think it's important that a constituent takes the time to, to write to me. It's important for me to take the time sure. to respond to them. Um, um, so, but yeah, technology, it's, it's, and I have to say it's been fun getting, uh, learning it. I really, I, I find it very fascinating. I, I think it's, it's just a great tool that we have uh, to use. So you'll so. stay on Facebook then? Yes, I, I believe I will. I have my own personal <laughs> Facebook page. Yes, I do. Um, and so I uh, keep that on my personal phone and, and do enjoy that. And I'm very blessed. While I don't have children, I have a niece and two nephews that help me with that. There so every go. once in a while I have to update <laughs> with them to say, explain to me how to do this or that. And right. they're real good. They help out. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, what legislation um, during your entire career uh, would you be most proud of? Most proud of? I've not been, had a lot of pieces of legislation. You probably found that out. But um, um, I think, and it, maybe it might not be legislation that I've actually prime sponsored. But I'll tell you, during my early years, it was those budgets that we got on, done on time. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we had the revenues back then. That was pro that was uh, pre 9/11, and so life was a little bit better in Pennsylvania. After 9/11, I mean that the impact of 9/11 just really, really, uh, the negative impact and, and all the you know just just what a trying time it became um, because of the uncertainty of the country, of the state, of everything that was going on around us. Um, but the budgets, on time budgets. I mean, I take that so. That's an oath that we take, to, yeah. and I, I just feel it's so important that, um, and so many people are out depending on us, whether it's a school district or a human service organization, your county, you know, your, your, your counties. Um, there's so many people out there depending on the legislature to get their budgets done on time, and I just think it's a critical, a critical thing we need to do. 
Um, so I've been very, I was very proud to always have timely mm -hmm. budgets. I'm very disappointed, very frustrated in these last uh, few legislative sessions, and, and uh, um, where it's been about, you know, it's been more about an argument of, and who got what as opposed to doing what's right and getting things done. Mm -hmm. um, uh, legislation, um, certainly on behalf of seniors, um, the rent and tax rebate program that we've helped develop that helped keep seniors in their homes. Um, the PACE program that have helped um, medical costs for seniors right. with prescription drugs, that type of thing. I think those programs are extremely important because our seniors, you know, as they retired many, many years ago and they retired out at much, much smaller wages and they're living maybe on a small, um, small uh, uh, retirement check and Social Security and it's hard to keep to make ends meet and stay in their homes. I, I think it's important that we we're mindful of that in the legislative process mm -hmm. that we try to make life affordable for our senior citizens and take care of them. Um, on the other perspective at the whole other end I think education is so important. Our public education system um, I come from a rural area that, that our public schools are very good schools. They're small schools and I have some concerns there but um, there's an issue, you know, busing and, and travel and the distance, which I talked to you a little bit about how the mm -hmm. district is. Um, but I think education is so very important, and a lot that we've done on behalf of, of, our, of our young people with public schools right. and, and so. You mentioned a couple bills that, um, regarding land and, and drilling that didn't pass, that you were disappointed. Mm -hmm. Any other legislation that you had in, um, introduced over the years that you were quite disappointed that didn't? get enacted? Um, certainly anything you work on that doesn't ultimately reach the end goal, you're disappointed. Sure. But sometimes you understand the process and the, like with this whole post-production issue, that's yeah. certainly one that's very disappointing. But I understand that maybe there's some misinformation out there about um, what we're really attempting to do. And, and when you're dealing with a signed lease, you're dealing with contracts. It becomes a legal issue. So it, it's really delicate in how you try to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to, uh, we, we deal with very often, and one thing I've probably been very disappointed in my legislative career is the number of bills that, the, that might have s seen challenges, and they weren't necessarily my bills, but bills that have seen challenges and so ultimately end up in the court process. Okay. And the courts overturn what we of the legislature have done. And I, I have a real, I have a sincere problem with the courts in trying to legislate from the bench, and I think many of our judges in, do attempt to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we have three branches of government, and I think it's very important that we retain three branches of government, and we as the legislative branch, we're trying to do things for the right reason. And, you know, sometimes if a judge doesn't necessarily agree, I mean, I, I think just now, I mean, I have a problem with them throwing out what they do, and, and just now with the, uh, uh, the gaming the gaming and you know, the, with the local share. Uh, the courts have just thrown that out. And so we've got given us four months to go back and correct it. Well, around in Harrisburg, it, four months goes by very quickly. <laughs> and we might not even be in session. And I don't think we're going to be. We're not going to be in session much of, most of November, mo all of December. And mm -hmm. we won't be back till the end of, they won't be back till the end of January. Right. I certainly won't be here. So they're, they're, they're giving us a timetable to fix something that isn't realistic. So. It can be frustrating. Then. It can be very frustrating, yeah. very frustrating with the courts and, and how they do overturn what mm -hmm. the legislature did. Um, the preemption issue with the, the whole gun issue, right. um, that's an issue. The, um, certainly my legislative district, as being as rural as it is, there's a lot of hunting in my district. There's a lot of gun owners in my district. There's a lot of gun collectors in my district. And there's people who believe very much that they, it's their constitutional right, their Second Amendment right to own a gun and to bear arms. And uh, as they might have a gun in their vehicle and be traveling from one uh, municipality to another or from one county to another, um, for them to have to worry about what those local gun laws might be just isn't realistic. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think, you know, that's another piece of legislation we need to go back and, and we're trying to fix that right now, um, trying to achieve that. So there's, there's various issues that are out there that uh, I might not have been the prime sponsor of, but I certainly, um, became very involved and became very interested because of my legislative sure. district it impacted. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, during your time in office you served on several different standing committees. Mm -hmm. Agriculture, finance, mm -hmm. professional licensure, ethics, education. Would you have a favorite one? Probably local government was a favorite okay. and agriculture. And I have to say that is one part of the process I've absolutely missed 
uh, being a leader. While I've absolutely enjoyed my role as a leader in our Republican caucus as caucus chairman, I absolutely enjoyed the committee process. Mm -hmm. um, serving on the Ag Committee, I probably got to know more about milk pricing and nutrient management than I'd ever, ever dreamed I would know. and found it very interesting and, and very, very eye-opening mm -hmm. um, uh, what, the, what the normal farmer deals with day in and day out, because um, I didn't grow up in a farming family. Um, so it was important for me to understand, because uh, agriculture was such an intricate part of my legislative district. Um, local government and that I'd been a, the county treasurer and so had a fascination in, in government and, I've, and certainly I've always had a fascination in government and how it works and to become with the, to deal with the, that local government level mm -hmm. um, from the county commissioners any of your any of your row offices okay. um, working at township officials you know just the different levels of government had a sincere interest in um, and what those, what uh, actions or what legislation we dealt with in those committees. I served on professional licensure for a while. That was a very interesting committee too, and in that we dealt with all the standing committees that uh, deal with all the licensure committees, right. um, all the licensing committees across the Commonwealth. And whether you're a doctor or a nurse or a realtor or a, um, whatever your role might be, you have to have a, um, you have to be registered or you have to have a certification or a license to do, to do those mm -hmm. roles. So I found that very interesting. Um, but I absolutely, when I became a caucus chairman and went off the committee process, absolutely missed it because oh. I thought that's where a lot of the work in the legislature actually mm -hmm. started and occurred. That's where a bill, once it was drafted and, and uh, was referred to a committee, that's where the work on the bill actually mm -hmm. started. And I really enjoyed, we had various subcommittees on which I sat on and so we would meet to discuss the legislation and maybe work on it or tweak it or file an amendment to make it better. Um, hold hearings, I always found the hearings very fascinating because of the information and the professionals, uh, the people in the know, so to say, would come before us as committee members to provide okay. testimony to us. And I thought that is such a, that is such an important part of the legislative process. And, and I'm a firm believer that, that the committee is where the, a lot of the work needs to be done uh, rather than when it gets to the entire house because when you have 203 members working on some something as opposed to maybe 21 or 22 I think a smaller group things tend to be more effective working in smaller groups yeah I was going to ask you some say that a lot of the real work gets done in the committee yes and, and so I you believe would agree should. with that I absolutely believe yeah. that one of the one of the things I probably missed doing as a member is I was never served as a chairman of a committee okay. and granted I would have had the um, seniority to serve on a to be to chair a committee um, because I was in leadership and chose to stay in leadership okay. and was very fortunate to be reelected to leadership five times by my colleagues um, it was one part I, I would have enjoyed being a, a chairman and I absolutely when I was thinking about retiring I absolutely contemplated um, maybe running one more time and coming back stepping out of leadership and coming back as a chairman so just to be able to serve as a chairman so I would thought I found I thought that would have been a very exciting role sure very oh. exciting role what challenges or advantages um, are there in being a female in the House of Representatives um, I think the, the challenge that you face is being taken seriously okay. by your male colleagues, and I think I've always worked to try to do that. I don't like to separate males and females. I think we're here as a, as a, t as a group to work as a team, and certainly I come, you know, my perspective as a female, I tend to be more hands-on, but I think that's more my personality. Um, I mean, I jokingly tell people I'm still pick up the telephone in my district offices, it ring, rings and my staff is busy. I do that in Harrisburg. I mean, I'm just, that's just me. Um, I'll dial my own phone, so to say. A lot of my male colleagues have to have their staff person dial the phone and say, oh, Representative so-and-so is on the phone and would like to speak to you. Well, I'll call the person directly. Um, but there again, here in Harrisburg, I think it's important that you, you, that you, you do have conversations with your male colleagues. You, you stress uh, the fact that you are knowledgeable on the issues and share your concerns or, or uh, have those conversations on the issues. And I think for the most part, the males um, that we're working with now um, do take the female, their female members very serious. They're very respectful. And at least those that I've always worked mm -hmm. with are very respectful um, um, and, and have a converse, having conversations and respect our opinions and input on the issues. Um, so um, while there's certainly many more males in the Pennsylvania House than there are females, I think we tend to work together as a team and, and in a respectful manner and, and get along well. Do you think that had changed during the time that you were in office? 
for the better? I do believe when I first came in, there might not have been res as the respect for them. There's always been about the same number of women in the right. house. It's always been right around uh, low 20s. It's always kind of fluctuated from 20 to 30 mm -hmm. um, female members. Um, and um, yes, I think early on, maybe there wasn't the respect. Maybe there was the thought that you, a woman should be home with the family. Um, in my case, I don't have children, but many of my female colleagues do. And I have great admiration for the, my female colleagues who, have, who are raising families mm -hmm. um, because it's got to be extremely stressful for them as they get their children on the bus in the morning and then get to Harrisburg. Uh, we have one female colleague who's, who's adopted uh, s several children, and, and she's doing wow. a remarkable job. Um, balancing her legislative work and, and her family. And I think that's what females absolutely have to do. They have to be, you know, there's, there's making sure the food's on the table and the children are have, have clothes and get to school and do their homework and that type of thing. So you have that role as a mother um, while men, um, you know, that perception that men get up in the morning and go off to work. But I think you have a lot more interaction. Um, I know a lot of my male colleagues. Um, you know, I know a lot of my male colleagues that go home for their children's game and might drive two hours home for a football game or a baseball game, and so I think the males have that same family commitment too. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to imply that they don't, because um, I absolutely believe they do. But um, as far as working together, um, both Republicans and Democrats, um, men, male, females, I think it's important that we work together as a team, because yeah. that's how we're going to ultimately resolve what the issues are and come to some type of agreement to get things done. You said that the number of women in the, the PA House kind of fluctuate between mm -hmm. 20 and 30 regularly. Do you think there are any barriers to prevent women from running, more women from for running for office? I don't think there are barriers. Um, it's only a barrier that somebody might create themselves. Okay. Um, but I think if you, you're doing the right thing home in your district, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a true desire to be in politics, mm -hmm. um, if you get out and you do the work that needs to be done to get elected, um, I think anyone, male or female, can be elected. So it's all about um, putting it together yourself and having that desire to work hard and, and get it done. So, um, but I don't think, I mean, I've not seen barriers that are actually put up. I mean, because I've seen uh, females defeat males and, and sure. vice versa. I mean, I've seen campaigns um, with both genders, I mean, both, you know, in the running for office. And okay. I think that they've, it's, it's all about the work that they do and how hard they work. Nice. I just have a few more questions I'd, I'd okay. like to ask you. Do you have any memorable events that took place in the house while you were here that you were part of? There are so many. Um, you know, right from events when we honor a, a deceased member, um, that in itself is just knowing the people who have been members of this of the chamber. And, and sometimes you know the person, or sometimes you don't know the person. Um, and they're just, I think they're very memorable events and I think it's important that we, we do that, that mm -hmm. we recognize those people who have served and um, um, certainly the celebrations of the, uh, uh, you know, we've had all kinds of sports teams come nice. to the, and be recognized, uh, you know, Little League World Series, uh, just some ex seeing young people um, to come to, this, to, to the hall of the house and be recognized. Um, I very often wish my colleagues would be more respectful and, and not carry on the conversations. And I think the speakers, uh, the past most recent speakers have done a very good job in controlling the conversations that are going sure. on in the hall. And I recognize the fact that sometimes conversations, um, you know, that members need to talk to members about what concerns they might have on the issues. But becoming, you know, just making it a social gathering yeah. when people are being recognized, I, I have real problem with that. And I think our members, our co my colleagues need to be a little bit more respectful because this is a big day and those, those people, and, and, and I don't Absolutely. care who they are, whether it's a young person, whether it's an adult or whoever it is, it's a big day, it's a big moment in their life that they're coming and they're standing on that rostrum and being recognized for whatever mm -hmm. they've done or whatever they've achieved. And, and we should be respectful and, and recognize that. Um, so there, there's any number of, of opportunities. I mean, I think every day in that chamber is, is something new and different. Um, and I've often said that with the work that I do, no two days are ever the same. And it's something that I've enjoyed. It's one of the reasons I enjoy doing my work because I, I don't like just the same old, same old. Same old. I, I like those mm -hmm. new adventures in life. But um, I mean, there's just been any number of events that have occurred in the house. And, and it, basically it's, it's honoring people. Um, people across our Commonwealth, we've got just such a diverse group of people and such a wonderful, wonderful uh, 
people in Pennsylvania, and it's great just to, to invite them to Harrisburg yeah. to be here in the Capitol. Because we talked earlier, I mean, this is just such a, it's a magnificent building, sure. and I just welcome anyone anytime to, to come and appreciate the building and, and know that it's their building, know it's the people's building, and that they should uh, take advantage of the opportunity to come mm -hmm. here anytime. So we do a lot of great things in the chamber, and, and I'm very proud of, of many of those events. What's your fondest memory? Oh, boy, that's a... <laughs> That's a tough one. So, um, just being a, actually just being able to, to speak on the Hall of the House. I think one of my fondest, one of the things I enjoy most doing as caucus chairman is, may, is calling caucus and the speaker recognizing me that I'm the person who comes to the microphone and, and, and uh, calls that caucus. Uh, informs the speaker when we'll come back to the back to the floor of course that has been working out that we always kind of meet that time but um, it's just it's just having that opportunity to be in leadership um, has been a, it's been a real honor for me absolutely has um, but fond memories I mean, I'm gonna have many and I'll have to sit and kind of write them down and uh, go through them but just have a lot of them um, the friendships you develop um, you know, the, the members as you get to know them, the little camaraderie you have with the little group around you to, to have conversations and, um, and be, while still being respectful, that sure. type of thing. Yeah, but. Uh, How would you like to be remembered? Hmm. You're gonna make me cry. No. <laughs> Cause that's, just as Sandy Major. Um, Someone who worked hard, um, served her constituency well, mm -hmm. and uh, did the best job as, as she could do. So, and I'm sorry, that's, I mean, but this, that gets me, answer. I told you I get emotional about <laughs> things. <laughs> I got through it yesterday, but. Well, I only yeah. have one more question Go for ahead. you. What advice would you give to someone who's interested in running for public office? Evaluate yourself and know that it's something you truly want to commit to do because it is a full-time responsibility. Um, people put their trust in you and they believe in you to do the right thing. They believe that you're going to come to Harrisburg and represent them and you are the one person with 62, 63,000 constituents. So you're their voice. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very, very uh, serious consideration that you have to make and um, you have to do it for the right reasons. Um, it, it's important. It's not about a title. Mm -hmm. It's about doing a job. And you have to be totally committed to do the job. And sometimes you have to set family aside. Sometimes you have to put your self, personal interest aside. And you have to do what's right for your constituency.